Greetings, welcome. In this lesson, we will model our box for our jack-in-the-box. In a subsequent lesson, we will rig the box. We're starting with an overview of the rig for the simple fact that the output of your model is determined by its use. In other words, if we were modeling this box for a 3D print, uh, our approach would be different. If we were modeling this box as a standalone item for a still print or an object that wasn't going to be animated, our approach to the model would be different. We are modeling this box for a deformational animation, and uh, our rig for that deformational animation will determine our approach to modeling. So just a quick review of the rig before we get started on the model. Here we have a handle which uh, controls the cluster, which controls the lattice points, and we can squish and squash that um, box in. We've got the top in a similar rig. Those lattice points are controlled by a cluster with an offset handle. We have the lid, and the lid isn't technically rigged, it is simply rotating, but we have an offset handle with the rest of our rigging handles. We have a squash deformer on top, which will allow us to squish and squash that head. And then the probably the most challenging part of this rig is the up and down and uh, left and right. And you can see that we can uh, squish and squash them. We're getting some penetration. We'll tackle that before we animate. All right. So those are the items, and everything that is going to be animated is being uh, handled separately as a independent model. All right, let's get started. Um, a word here about file management. If you haven't done so, you can create a folder in your projects window, call it Jack, and then set the project there. Now, mine's already set, so I'm not going to click here. Uh, it will ask you for a default workspace. Click that middle item for default workspace. And then once you've done that, you'll come back and choose project window. And it will create all the subfolders. And then go up and just right off the bat, save your scene. And uh, save it to that scenes folder uh, that's contained within your newly created Jack folder. So set project choose default workspace, and then come and choose project window, and just say OK. And you'll have a brand new folder with all the subfolders, and we'll save your jack there. Give you a second to do that, and we'll come back and we'll get started. Be right back. Welcome back. Now that you've created your subfolders, uh, let's get started. We'll be creating a polygonal version of this model. There is also a set of lessons for creating the box as NURBS, and I'll, I'll provide a link to that if you're interested in creating a NURBS version or at least just looking at the workflow for NURBS. Again, poly modeling shelf, we'll create our cube. And the first thing we're going to do in the channel box is come over to inputs, and we'll create subdivisions width, height, and depth too. So we're just giving that two on the width, height, and depth subdivisions. We'll come up to the scale, and we'll make it 10 by 10 by 10. And this is sitting in the middle of the ground plane, and so we'll move it up five units so it's sitting perfectly on the bottom. Now we're going to uh, delete the top and the bottom faces. Uh, whenever you're deleting faces or drawing a bounding box, probably a best idea to come into an orthographic view. You could manually shift around and select, but if we jump into the top view and draw a bounding box here, we can just hit delete, and we've, uh, with one foul swoop, deleted the top and bottom, uh, those eight faces. A little more efficient than shift selecting around. All right, we are going to bevel the four corner edges. And so uh, we'll just manually select. In this case, uh, we don't have a clean bounding box way to select. So we've got those four. If you want to just take a look, it's the four corner edges. And we'll jump into the modeling toolkit and we'll say bevel. Our uh, options come up and we want our fraction point one. We want this rather tight. And then our segments will be two. And so that just gives us a little edge. And if we right click and come back to object mode, you can see how that beveled edge is now picking up the light. 
Uh, one thing to note, we're modeling Z forward, so we'll be dolling around and working, but as we begin to create the features that are on the side and back, take note that we're modeling Z forward. All right, we'll right click and choose this top edge, and we're gonna go through an ex uh, a series of extrusions. And we'll talk about some of the, some of the different uh, means of extruding here. Uh, in this case, we can just drive the local Z. So we can drive that out, and we're gonna make it relatively small, we'll say a 0.2. Uh, so we've moved that out, uh, 0.2, very small bevel. And we'll come back and we'll extrude again. And we're gonna drive this in the uh, positive direction. And let's make this uh, an even two. So we'll say negative two on that Z extrude. And we'll extrude a third time. We'll hit extrude. And in this case, if we drive in the uh, local Z, if we were to drive that in the negative direction, you can see how these edges are now overlapping. We, we don't want that, we can't, we can't have that. So this is an instance when we would want to use the manual scale. And we want to scale in world space. You'll recall that this um, extrude has a dial. Uh, there are lots of dials on our tools. This is just a two mode dial, either world space or local space. And we want to click that dial or switch so that we're in world space. Uh, it's it's uh, at about three o'clock uh, on a uh, clock face. And we see that we've centered our uh, extrude tool. Now we want to scale and we want to scale proportionately. I don't want to just click on one of these so uh, or scale on one of these but I can click on one of the cubes that activates the proportional scale uh, or uniform scale cube and then we can pull this in. Now we don't have an exact number here but uh, we're just going to eyeball that to about one unit uh, a little bit more we want to have a nice great big space for our jack head to come out. We're going to have a comical character whose head is too big technically to fit in there, but we'll have it uh, scale out for humor's sake. So there is our uh, third extrusion, and we use the scale, not the local translate Z, on that third extrusion. And now we'll come back to standard practice. We'll just hit extrude, and we're going to drive this one down. And so let's say negative one. So that fourth is driven down, negative one on the scale. And there is uh, our box top. Now, if we right click to object and we hit the three key, as is good practice as you're modeling, hitting the three key does a couple of things. It primarily shows us how this will subdivide. And then it also, uh, if there is unwelded or unmerged vertices, you'll have a tendency to see it. If there are non-quads, uh, you'll be able to see it a little bit easier in the smooth version. So it's always a good idea to just go back and forth as you're modeling. Now, what this is showing us is that those nice hard edges that we created are going to be too smooth. And we'll come back um, later in the lesson, and we'll just insert some edge loops uh, to tighten, tighten those up and or uh, bevel those edges. But we're gonna say that's okay for now, looks good. And now we're going to create the uh, interior uh, cylinder uh, that the jack sits in. I'll give you a second to catch up to this point and we'll get started in the next section. Be right back. All right, so you've created your box to this point and a recommendation that I always make to students is uh, try this a few times from scratch uh, and uh, execute it the number of times that it takes you that you can commit this to memory. This box model is fairly straightforward. It is an intermediate model, but uh, uh, our intermediate students ought to be able to handle this. The rigging portion, a little more difficult, a little bit more difficult to commit to memory, but you ought to be able to model. So at the uh, each section end, Take some time just to practice the techniques that we employed and really commit those to your memory. All right, we're going to create a cylinder and we're going to combine and uh, bridge. We have to have our cylinder with the same number of vertices. And so let's count, right? 3, 6, 9, 12 plus these four is 16. So we're going to create a polygonal cylinder. And uh, I'm just going to drive this up here so we can see it. 
and we'll come to the channel box and we said 16. So we want 16 subdivisions. Remember that when we are combining polygonal models and uh, merging the vertices or welding the vertices, there has to be the same number. So we'll have 16 here. Now we'll scale this up a little bit and I want to delete the top and the bottom. You've got a couple of options here. Um, we could select what we want to keep, right? So I, I drew a bounding box and I don't have the top or the bottom. And then I can draw a shift bounding box. And the shift bounding box selection, you'll recall, inverses the selection. So I selected what I wanted to keep, shift selected, and then now we can hit delete. And that's probably the most efficient way to do it. You could also, uh, again, jump into the top view. I've clicked off here, and if we draw a bounding box in the middle, making sure not to select the edges, that is also a quick way to get the top and the bottom and to hit delete. All right, so we've created a cylinder with 16 subdivisions, and let's jump back into the top view, and we're going to scale this up. And because we're going to connect it, we need a little bit of room for a clean subdivision. Uh, ultimately, we're going to subdivide this box. And if you have edges that are too close, when you go to subdivide, you have uh, uh, edges that are too close, and you can get some um, undesired effects in the model. So we wouldn't want to say, for instance, go that close. Something, something like a quarter of a unit, at least, when you're making connections, in most instances. So that is about right, and if you're following me, let's just make it an even 3.75. That seems 3.7, 3.75, somewhere in there. Now, this next part, um, we want to place the top of the cylinder at the bottom of this uh, top piece here, and we want them to be uh, perfectly in line so that the bridge that we create is flat. So how can we do that? Well, let's put the pivot uh, at the top here, and then we'll snap it in line with this edge. I'm going to hit the D key. You'll recall that uh, repositioning a pivot is tapping the D key. And I'm going to slide this up. And I'm going to remind you, if it's been a while uh, since you've done some of this uh, snapping, that uh, I am now constrained on the Y, which is actually what we want. But any time that you're snapping, you want to be aware. Uh, am I limiting myself? Do I see a yellow arrow? Right, Because this is, uh, if I were to click back in the middle, this would be omnidirectionally. I can snap in any direction. So if I hit the D key and we were to come and hit the C key to snap to this edge, it snaps to the edge because it is free to do so. We see all three axis colors. If I have a yellow arrow, that means uh, I am constrained on that axis. Now if I were to hold the C key in the middle mouse button, you see that it snaps down, but it maintains the X and Z value. Uh, it's right in the middle there. I'll just undo that and uh, do that again. We'll select the object. Let's pretend we see all three colors omnidirectionally. I'll tap the D key to get into reposition pivot mode. And I want to constrain myself on the Y. So we'll click that Y. We see it yellow now. That represents constraint. And then you can snap either to this vertex or uh, to this edge. So I can, I can V snap, I'll hit undo, or I can C snap. Either way, I'm snapping to the top. And there's a, a vertex at the top, and there's an edge at the top. So we have that now and then we won't forget tap the D key again to get out of reposition pivot mode. So now we can snap this here. Uh, let's turn on our wireframe, this icon here, and this will allow us to see a little bit better. So once again I want this to be active. If it was omnidirectionally and I went to say snap to this vertice, right, it snaps over there. So we will right, make this active and then hold down the V key and we'll snap to that vertice. And we've got it. Um, that may, uh, if, if it's been a while since you've done some of that snapping, you may need to uh, rewind and tackle that. 
And as I mentioned a moment ago, practice that enough uh, to where it becomes uh, comfortable uh, doing that. Now, as we proceed here, I can see that we've got a normals uh, issue. We want the interior of the box to be outward, and currently uh, it's inward. So with this selected in object mode, and in the modeling mode, we can come to Mesh Display Reverse. Mesh Display Reverse. Now we have the outside, which is what we're going to see, inward facing. And now we're ready to combine and bridge these two separate meshes. If we look here in the outliner, right, we've got our cylinder and we've got our box. Those are the only two that we have. Also not a bad idea as we're working, let's just go ahead and delete all of our history. Uh, this will clean up our inputs. And uh, if you haven't been doing so, uh, increment and save. Um, every time you come to a point where you've created something that you'd hate to lose, uh, hit increment and save. And then also, if you work yourself into a corner uh, going forward, uh, you can come back to a previous version. So increment and save often. Recommend every five to 10 minutes or every time you have something that you would hate to lose. All right, we're going to select the two, the two poly meshes. We'll jump into the modeling toolkit and we'll hit combine. And now we could, if we just uh, double click this edge and shift double click this edge, we can hit bridge. But oftentimes when you have this number of edges, uh, it may not calculate properly. Our cylinder might not be facing the same orientation as the box. And so we we'll hit bridge and you can see that there. The cylinder is facing, looks like maybe 180 degrees. Since we already combined it, we could uh, uh, separate them and rotate that and try and find the degree. Probably a more practical, and this is something that uh, occurs even in instances when you don't have the ability to rotate one of the objects. We can just uh, manually bridge two edges and then uh, it will know where to start from. So we can just hit bridge, we've got those. And then now I can double click. Uh, another slight caveat here, if I just were to double click and hit bridge, don't, don't do this, but watch. I hit bridge and it bridged around and at first glance you say, oh good. But you'll note that there are uh, uh, no edges here. It just bridged all the way around. And if we hit the three key, and this is what's so important about going back and forth between one and three, because we can't uh, see that problem necessarily. When you hit the three key, you see, oh, I've got a great big end gone in the middle. So we'll undo that. And let me just uh, execute that again from scratch. So we've created this one bridge across. We'll double click. And then these are the two edges that we don't want. This edge here, highlighted green currently, and this edge here highlighted green. So I want to deselect those edges. So I'll hold the uh, control key to deselect, control key to deselect. Now if you look, right, we've got the edges all the way around, except for the two edges of that new face that we created. And now when we hit bridge, we've got the new shape with all of the edges, and it is symmetrical all the way around. So we've got uh, our basic box to this point. You can hit the three key and you can see that it's way too smooth. Good time to increment and save as well. Now, before we wrap up this section, let's come around and insert some edge loops and or bevels so that we maintain the areas of hardness because we are going to subdivide this at least once. Now, a word on bevel and uh, inserting an edge loop. A bevel is just giving you at least two additional edge loops, one on either side of the selected edge. When you have an edge that's very close, you probably don't want to use bevel. Uh, and we can just take a look here. I'm gonna double click this edge. I wanna bevel this to keep this circle hard or this uh, cylindrical shape hard at the edge. And if I hit bevel, right, it, it pushed it this way, and then when I go to hit segments, uh, although that's not, that's not too bad, we could hit the three key and see. But there is a little pinching here uh, because of the closeness of, there, of that, uh, the proximity of that. So we'll come back to one, and let's just do it manually. We'll manually put in 
an edge loop here on the bottom and see what that looks like. And we could even put two here. And that would be better than having the edge up here, as I mentioned. We don't want our components um, uh, very close, closer than about 20% uh, of a unit. Um, funny things can begin to happen in your model. So you'll recall that the multi-cut allows us to just cut across faces, and we'll be doing that in this lesson. But even more common is the shortcut, at least for introductory and beginning intermediate, where we use it as an edge loop tool. So with my multi-cut selected, we'll hold the control key, and uh, we could snap it to 10%, but because my cylinder is kind of arbitrarily long, uh, I didn't specify a length, you can just eyeball it. Or if you wanted to engage the snap step, reminder, you could hold the shift key. So that's exactly 10% of this length. But I'm gonna just slide that up there. I'm on an edge and uh, with the multi-cut tool selected and my control key down, uh, we see that the edge loop is going uh, perpendicular to the edge that I am on. And so we'll click there. And now when we hit three, you see that that's much tighter. And that is, that is about what we want. Same thing here, we probably wouldn't want to hit bevel just because of the closeness, right? If we beveled this edge and beveled this edge, we'd have uh, two additional edges in here, very close, too close for comfort, if you will. So let's use that same technique. We'll use the uh, multi-cut tool and the control key. We'll put it on an edge. We get a perpendicular edge loop. Uh, I'm not going to hold down the shift key, which would lock us to 10%. Just going to eyeball that there. We'll put that there. Now when we hit the three, uh, we see that that edge is maintained. Come back to one. Now in this instance, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got plenty of space on either side. So the bevel would work for us. We'll double click that edge. And rather than manually putting an insert, an edge loop, an insert, an edge loop, we can just hit bevel. We'll drive that fraction in. Let's say, what would that want to be? Let's say a 0.2. I'm unable to scrub to 0.2, so I'll manually type that in. And let's see, can we scrub up to 0.2 segments? Yep, and we've got two there. So the bevel, right, essentially is just uh, at the very minimum giving us two edge loops on either side of the selected edge. We'll hit the three key, that looks nice. Come back to one. Likewise here, the bevel tool is a candidate because we've got plenty of space on either side. We'll double click that edge, hit bevel, and we've determined that 0.2 and 2 are good for us. And then here we are with a similar situation. This lip here is too thin, right? I wouldn't want to bevel this edge and bevel this edge. Now I've got really close uh, edges here, or I would have really close edge loops. So we'll come to multi-cut, and we'll just manually, right? I'm holding the control key to engage the insert edge loop version of the tool. And uh, we'll click there, and let's just go ahead and, and insert this one. We'll insert an edge loop there. And then we'll come out, and we can see, right-click to object mode, click off. We've got good topology, right? And we've got uh, hard edges where we want them. And we can turn off the wireframe to really evaluate that. So there is our box. And the final thing we'll do on the box before we move on to the box top is complete the bottom. So uh, I'm going to turn off the grid here temporarily. We will right click and choose edge. And we'll, we could bridge across. It's probably more efficient just to come up to uh, mesh fill hole. And then a word here. Right, we've got an in gun. In the one, you wouldn't be able to see that. Now, obviously, the number of edge loops, uh, you, would, you would be able to see that. But visually, it looks OK. One of the reasons we are going back and forth between one and three. So we've got this great, big, ugly uh, in gun there. So let's just uh, combine these edges. And uh, I'll mention a word about clean topology. We'll come to the multi-cut. And here, we're not using it as the edge loop. We're not using the control key to create an edge loop. We're using the multi-cut in its uh, default setting, which just allows us to draw between uh, vertices. We'll hit enter there, so we've connected that one. Same thing here, we'll click drag till we can't drag anymore. Click drag till we can't drag anymore and hit return or enter on the PC. 
And then here is our perennial challenge to maintain four-sided faces, quads. Now, this is a, a fun puzzle. Um, hopefully it's a fun puzzle. But you can, uh, you can accomplish that uh, in a variety of ways. Let me do it in a uh, less than stellar way. I could create quads here at the bottom. I could come across here. Don't do this. I'm giving you an example of a poor solution. Come across here and here and hit enter. Now I have technically created all quads. This is this face, this face, all of these faces are four. One, uh, if we come to edge, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So you've got four edges all the way across, but you have what is a star, a, what is referred to as a star meeting. And this, uh, in this particular instance, we wouldn't see it because it's a, a flat surface. But if there was any curvature to the surface where you have a star, there tends to be a little bit of an indentation, especially when you subdivide. Now, in a lot of models, if you think of our jack head model, we did have some star points, but we tried to uh, drive those star points to an area of the face, uh, like the nostril, like the corner of the mouth, uh, maybe where the ear attaches to the head, where that strategic little indentation that may occur uh, actually works. So star point, be careful of it. Um, and if you can figure out a way to create the quad without stars, that's your best bet. So I'm going to undo. Oops, let's redo that one back. And if we just drive it this way, if I come from this uh, point to this point, we'll hit enter. And then we'll just go around, right? This point to this point. I'm dragging and dragging and dragging and dragging. Now we've given ourselves fours, even though this is a little bit triangular looking, right? It has four, one, two, three, four. And now when we hit three, we've got a nice, uh, we've got a nice quad without a five point star. Now again, because it's flat, visually it would, it would render the same. But anytime there's a contour, that star can potentially cause you problems. So if you can solve a edge flow problem with nice squares uh, as opposed to a star, that is your best bet. And then finally, we want this to be a little bit uh, harder at the bottom. And so we'll use the multi-cut tool, control key edge loop, and we'll hit that there. And you can see now our box model our literal box model. Box model is a phrase for your primitive version, but this is a box model of a box. Uh, looks good. And let's just turn on that uh, wireframe. Dolly around. I'm in the three preview smooth mode. And there is our box. You would certainly want to increment and save. And I'll give you a second to uh, complete that and catch up. And then we'll continue with the lid in the next section of the video. Be right back. All right, welcome back. Let's work on the top. I've created a layer and set this to it so that we can just quickly hide that away. We'll create a cube and we'll slide it up. And we're going to create divisions on the top and bottom, but not the side. So we've got our cube here. We'll open the inputs in the channel box. And my subdivision width will be 2 and my depth will be two. We don't need an edge loop running around the center, so we're going to leave the height at one. Let's jump into the top view, and we'll scale this up. Now, one unit is a good starting point. I think one unit will fit in there nicely. And so, right, I don't want to come and scale because now I'm also affecting the Y. So if we jump into the orthographic top view, and we want to just scale on the Z and the X, that would be this icon here, this green square. And so we can slide that, and you can see that it's only affecting, right, it's only affecting the Z and the X. And uh, I just wanted to get it into proximity. That's going to be about 7.5. Once we smooth this, uh, it looks to be about 7.5. 
So our cube, 7.5 on the x scale, 1 on the y scale, 7.5 on the z scale, 2 on the width, 1 on the height, 2 on the depth. And we've got it currently sitting uh, well above just as we're working on it here. And the first thing that we're going to do is uh, bevel these edges. I'm going to go ahead and hide our box so that we can see a little more clearly. Now, uh, unlike some others where you're uh, beveling all the edges, we don't want these center edges. So we want to deselect the center edges. And always best in making, not always best, oftentimes best when making uniform selections to do it in the orthographic view. So just out of good habit, I'm going to jump up to the top view and we'll hold the control key. You'll recall that is to deselect. Uh, I quickly hit the Q key. Uh, we'll deselect those central ones and you can see that they've been deselected on the top and the bottom. That was the advantage the orthographic view gave us. And then we'll do the same. Now, there's probably not an advantage uh, in this version to going to the orthographic views, but I'll, I'll just do it for consistency. Come to the side view and I'll hold down the control key, draw a little bounding box to deselect those. And we can see that they're deselected. And then we'll jump into the front view and do the same, control key, deselect. I said there wasn't really a time advantage, right? Because the other, ver uh, if I undo that, I could have just uh, control deselected around. That seems to be about the same time, so no advantage to that method either way. But take a look here. We've got the outer edges selected, and this is what we're going to bevel. Those blue edges you can see are unselected. We'll jump into the modeling toolkit, and we'll hit bevel. And our fraction, let's see, 0.2, and our segments will be 2. Right click to object mode, 5 key to take a look at that and we've got our box top. You may have noticed there's slight contour uh, to our box, and so we could give a little bit of contour uh, to our box top. Uh, if you left it square like this, I don't think anyone would notice, but let me just demonstrate that. We'll bring back our box, and let's also verify that one on the Y was correct. So we could uh, put this down here, right here is the recess in which it's sitting, now I've just eyeballed that. If I wanted to be absolutely certain that it was exactly flush, it would be the same technique of snapping. I would want to put my pivot at the top and then snap it to this edge. We can go ahead and do that. We can, uh, just as good practice, tap the D key. That gets us into reposition pivot mode. We'll just slide this up out of the way and that uh, also has activated our constraint. We see the yellow arrow. And then with our V key, middle mouse button, we can snap that down. Tap the D key again to get out of that. And then likewise, if I was to snap this here to any of these components, right, let me just demonstrate. In Omni mode, where we see all three colors, if I was to try to snap to this, right, it snaps over to it. We want to constrain it. So I can click here, once again, constrained on the Y, and if I hold the V key and click, it snaps down. It's only changing that uh, value, not the X or the, the Z value. All right, and that's sitting there. And uh, one unit was our key. Now, if you were being really precise, or maybe, uh, right, because we haven't gotten to the point where we would diverge our modeling uh, for a different output. Let's say we were going to 3D print this, and these pieces actually did have to fit together. We've got penetrating sections here. For our animation, no one is going to see that, so it's really not a concern for us. Good example of this would be a concern for a 3D print, but not a concern for an animation because you wouldn't see that. But just for clarity, we could just come and grab these vertices and just move them up a little bit. Now they're not penetrating. All right, uh, I was mentioning the contour of the box. So let's look in the top. So right there's a little bit of a bulge out here and we could mimic that. We could just come around and grab these 
vertices and we can scale. We don't want to scale from the middle, right? Because that would also drive the Y value. We just want to drive the X and the Z value. So we'll use this icon here. And uh, also let's hit the three key so we can see that. And right, that would be too much, right? And here we're going in, there it is square. And so we're just giving a slight contour. Again, as I mentioned, um, viewer may not even notice this, but if this were going to be a still render, now, uh, as an example, or it was going to be still and uh, really focused on, then you might want to add this step. So there is the box top uh, sitting in there nicely. And we're going to next create uh, the hinge uh, or the cylinder. So I'll let you uh, get to this point and you would certainly want to increment and save and we'll pick up in the next section. Welcome back. Let's jump into the top view. And uh, the top view is easy for us to see that Z is forward. So we're going to create a little bit of space here for our uh, cylindrical hinge. And we'll begin by selecting these vertices. And we'll just slide them forward. We need enough space to uh, place our cylinder here. Also, we want this to be flat as it faces the cylinder. So in the last section, we, we took a moment to kind of contour this a little bit. Now we're working backwards. We'll grab the scale tool and just drive the Z and that will flatten those positions. And just a quick word here, the, this technique is often used when you're mirroring across an axis. If you've accidentally pushed a vertex across the center line or short of the center line and you need to line everything back up, you can just select all those vertices and then use the scale tool and drive it on the axis you want to flatten out. All right, so we've created some uh, space for our cylinder. I'm going to go ahead and hide my box. And let's create our cylinder. We'll come up to Poly Modeling Shelf Cylinder. I'm going to slide this up and we'll rotate it onto its side. You could type in 90 or hold the J key and rotate that around, negative 90 or positive 90, doesn't matter. We're going to be subdividing and 16 is about the starting point for for base level smoothness. So we're going to anticipate that uh, subdivision by making this 8 because when we subdivide it, it will become 16, which is minimum for uh, circular or spherical smoothness. Now we'll position this uh, Let's uh, in the top view, right? So Z forward. We also need to rotate it in this direction. And then we'll scale it to fit. So We'll scale it down to about that position and out. And then we'll slide it forward. And we'll turn the box on and take a look and that fits nicely. Uh, if you needed to um, scale this down a little bit, right, you could just come back and pick these vertices if you needed a little bit more space. But I think we got that right on. Okay, uh, and we'll position this in the orthographic view. Uh, slide that down. And if we wanted to match it exactly, um, you may, right, we want the cylinder to fit. We're going to imagine that there are pins running through here to, to uh, attach it to the box. For your uh, custom version, uh, some students are really interested in creating mechanisms that would work in the real world. Uh, also, if we were going to 3D print this and actually create a little toy, we would need this mechanism to work. Um, but because we're animating, and this is not the focus of our animation, this cylinder, we'll just leave it kind of free-floating in here. But we do want to attach it to the rest of the top. We'll come to the channel box, and I'm going to go ahead and hide that again. And let's think about topology. So. If we're going to be making an attachment, we have to have the same number of edges. Let's hit one key. We see that this was beveled, right, on the edge. So let's bevel our cylinder on the edges. We'll choose edge. We'll double click that outer edge. We'll shift double click this outer edge. We'll come to the modeling toolkit and we'll hit bevel. And let's choose point two and two. And so there we have it. But again, counting the edges, we need a central edge here. So let's just insert an edge loop. 
we'll come, uh, let's come back to object mode. We'll choose the multi-cut tool. And your snap step by default is 10%. So change it to 50% so that we can put one right in the middle to match the existing top. You'll recall the control key gives us the edge loop and the shift key engages the snap step, which we've set to 50. So we'll click that in there. So now we have the exact uh, number. Before we combine and bridge though, we want our flat, uh, we want the flat part of the cylinder uh, facing the existing box top. So let's come into object mode and um, let's rotate this. And that'll be 22.5. So uh, if I started to rotate it, you can see about when does it become flat. Um, we'll type in 22.5 which is half of 45, which works with our eight. And so now that's flat there. All right. Now this, uh, I'm thinking this is a little bit uh, small. So I'm just going to scale it up a little bit. We'll come back and uh, bring that back in there. And then I want to just make sure it's still fitting my box. And it is. So when we hit the three key, we'll get a little bit of contour there. So just I did scale that up a little bit if you were following exactly with what I was doing. All right, hide that box top. Now, we're going to combine it. We're going to delete these interior faces and then bridge across. It, when we have a tight space like this, it's difficult to make those selections. So let's uh, zero out these transformations. Then we can move it, delete the faces, and then just type in a zero to get it back here. If we look at the cylinder's current position, right, we see all of these values here. We can come up to Modify, Freeze Transformation, and this will just zero it out. This makes this current position this object's origin. So we'll hit Freeze Transformations, and you see that that's zeroed out. Now we can slide that out, right? And uh, when we want to get it back, we can just type zero in there. So we're going to delete, uh, let me, select my faces. We're going to delete these two faces. Note I don't have the part of the bevel. Just delete those two. We'll come here and delete these two. And now we have corresponding and we have the same number of edges so the bridge tool will work uh, perfectly. And then as I just mentioned to get this back to the position it was all I have to do now is type 0 and it's back to its local origin. All right, take a look there. If you want to look in the wireframe, this is what it looks like uh, smooth. And let's go ahead and bridge. Uh, now, before we continue, I see that I've got a lot of information in my input. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll delete that history. We'll come to modeling and we'll hit combine. So this is a singular shape probably could have waited to delete history because I've got these transforms here left over from the two original shapes. Deleting all my history will rid us of those. Not a bad idea. We know that this only other shape is our box and here we have our top. And right, we've got a singular shape but there is a gap. So we will select this edge. I double click that edge if you want to hit the four key to see that. Come back to the five. And I'm going to double click this edge, hit the four key. So we've got the two corresponding edges with the same number of components, which means that we can execute the bridge tool. We'll hit bridge. And now that generated a new set of faces. We'll hit the three key. And we have our box top with a cylindrical hinge. Let's bring back our box. And that's what we're after. Let's position the pivot just so we can see it function, right? Because currently the pivot's in the middle. And so we'll tap the D key, as you know, right? And we'll limit ourselves on the Y. And we want it right in the center. So we'll get in here nice and tight. Even though I can't see it, I know that uh, I'm constrained on the Y. I know that I'm in reposition pivot mode. Just get in here nice and tight because it's a small space. And we'll hit V, middle mouse button. And as I come back, I can see that that snapped into place. Tap the D key, we'll bring back the box, and we can see uh, our box top functioning. 
Now again, sometimes students are, are very um, tedious about their mechanics, which is great. You would probably want to create a pin that connected this hinge to, to the box. Um, but because we would need a hole, uh, bullying that hole there would be a little bit of a, I would call that an advanced challenge if we were keeping everything quads. If someone's really interested in that, I can create a separate video lesson on creating a all quad hole for that pin to fit through. But for us animating, uh, n n the viewer isn't going to notice that. All right. So there's our box and our box top. We've got two more items to create, the crank and then the uh, spring itself. So we'll come back and we'll create our crank. See you in a second. Okay, let's work on our crank. We'll hide our two box items and we'll jump into the front view. And we're going to start at the origin. We're going to create a crank using a NURBS modeling method. NURBS models typically begin with a network of curves, and then the geometry is created from those curves. Polygonal workflow, as you know, is typically begun with a primitive, and then faces and edges are extruded. That's the most common polygonal workflow. So here we're going to generate a curve network. In this case, one curve will be a profile, one curve will be a path. We'll execute a NURBS extrude and we'll generate the shape. So we'll come to NURBS and we'll say CB Curve Tool and we're at the origin and we're going to grid snap our first point right at the origin holding down the X key. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. When you're done uh, laying out the vertices for your curve, you hit return. Now we'll create the profile and we'll create a NURBS circle. Create NURBS primitives circle. We could have con uh, also gone over to the shelf, but we want to open the dialog box. The uh, circle by default is cubic 8, which gives you a circle. We're going to switch this to linear and 6, and this will give us a hexagonal shape. Now, if we look at this in the perspective view, we can see that. A and this will be our profile curve, and this will be our path curve. Our profile, though, needs to sit at 90 degrees to the path. So we'll rotate this up using the J key, 90 degrees. Or you could have just typed in 90, 90 or negative 90, doesn't matter. And then this would be way too big. So let's scale it uh, 0.2. Oh, actually, that's too small. Let's say 0.25. That's a good size. And if we wanted to change it after the fact, with our history intact, we could come back and change it. So if we want to change it, make it larger or smaller, we can, even after the fact. So uh, selection order is important. I use the terms profile and path. There's nothing that automatically says these are profile or path other than the selection order. So I'll select this hexagonal shape first. This then is the profile. Shift select this S shape, which is the path. And we're going uh, in the modeling mode. We're skipping all of our polygonal mesh tools and coming out to surfaces. The long term would be NURBS surfaces. And you'll see that there's an extrude tool here, but it works differently than the extrude tool that you'll find in your polygonal modeling kit. So surfaces extrude. And you see that that's run across there. And I actually said negative 90 or 90. Here's a good example of, in NURBS at least, how you would get something reversed. Our history is intact, so let's go back and grab the circle. And rather than 90, let's make it negative 90. And uh, that flipped it around. So we've got negative 90. That was a key. We could have also gone up and uh, reverse the direction of the shape, and that would have flipped it as well. Uh, but kind of interesting to note there. Now we're going to, uh, I mentioned you can, with your history intact, make uh, changes after the fact. We could come and you can see you can make that larger or smaller. So if you just want to eyeball the size, maybe that's about where you want it. I've got a 2.69 here. Likewise, you can come to the path as well. I'll hit the four key so we can see that a little better. And if I were to grab that vertice right of the path, you can change it as well. If you wanted this to be higher or lower 
or something like that. But we're going to stick with this one for our first uh, few generations of our box. And that means we no longer need the uh, supporting curve. We no longer need the profile or the path, and we'll hit delete. Now, uh, we're going to leave this as NURBS. There's nothing that says within the Autodesk universe we can mix and match polys and NURBS. They can't be attached or combined, but because we're animating, the shapes that are going to move or transform independently need to remain separate uh, anyway. If we were going to take this uh, to a 3D print, we would convert this NURBS to a poly, or we were going to take it to a video game engine, we would also want to convert it to a poly. But we can just leave it here uh, as a NURBS. We want to have a little uh, ending there, and you could make it as a poly. If you were going to texture it, you could pro you'd probably want to use it as a poly, but let's just, we'll make our crank 100% uh, NURBS. And uh, I'm going to rotate this onto its side. This is a NURBS sphere. And uh, you can see it looks a little bit different than our polysphere. And we'll grid snap this out here. And maybe just uh, scale that down. And yeah, if you wanted to leave it round, you, you can, right? Maybe it looks like that or that. Probably not that. Let, Let's, let's say something like this. That's a good crank. And then we'll just parent. We'll parent this object to this object, and we'll hit lowercase p. Now when we select that crank, uh, they both highlight. You can also see um, making attachments to nerves. We're not going to attach these. Um, in uh, polygonal modeling, it is called combining. In nerves modeling, it's called detaching. And we're not going to attach this either. We'll just manually position this. We'll bring our box back, best done in our orthographic view, and we'll grid snap this up. And there is our box with the crank. We will come back in the next video when we go to rig and we'll create the spring geometry. The spring geometry and the spring rig kind of go hand in hand, so it'll be easier to uh, understand the process if we do that together. So we have our box top, we have our box, and now we have our NURBS crank. Here is our box. All right, uh, anticipate questions in the discussion forum, the tech, this week's tech discussion forum. See you there. Have a good one.